again. Uh, if there is still somebody enjoying a coffee or a cake outside, please come to the conference room as we will be uh, as we will be starting with the next panel. Uh, welcome back to the main stage. I hope you enjoyed the both of the breakout sessions uh, panels. Uh, in the first half of the day, uh, we started to understand the, the challenges that we face and uh, what state of the play is uh, on the West. Our next panel will explore the thinking behind our movement and that and the ideas that makes us strong as conservatives. Please welcome to the stage the moderator for this panel on philosophy of freedom, Peter Klepper, editor of Brussels Report. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, everybody can hear me. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, wonderful city and, and great conference. Uh, congratulations to Witold and the team for uh, putting us together. So um, this panel will explore uh, the philosophy of freedom. Um, that's sort of what brings conservatives, libertarians, classical liberals, center-right uh, people uh, together. Uh, it's very uh, valuable and um, we have a truly excellent uh, panel. Um, and uh, we will start with, um, with the lady, of course, with uh, Barbara Kohn, uh, who I know for a very long time. Uh, Barbara is the, um, the, um, the president of the, uh, the Austrian Economics Center um, in Vienna. Uh, she is also the, uh, the, the vice president of the Austrian Central Bank. Uh, and uh, for, uh, for a long time she has been organizing the, the free market roadshows, uh, which I have been, had the pleasure to, um, to attend. So, so um, uh, please, Barbara, uh, what's, uh, what's your take on, on, um, on, on, on this topic, the philosophy of freedom? Um, of course, Hayek, Austrian economics plays an extremely important role in, in that. Thank you, Peter, and thank you again to New Direction for hosting us and for running uh, this special panel on uh, the state of uh, freedom and actually liberty. And uh, coming in from the philosophical point of view, we should also look is because we have conservative partners here as well, is freedom and liberty the same? This is something that is being discussed among the academics uh, of the Austrian school, the Chicago school, and elsewhere. Is this exactly the same thing? Or are there differences? And then we have the, th the next angle. Uh, how do those two terms go together with conservatism? And Hayek, as you already mentioned, being the grand seigneur of uh, the freedom movement, at least uh, for those who have uh, roots in economy and political economy, um, has given us various answers. And there are many definitions of freedom and liberty. And as a panel was, uh, was asking the questions whether, uh, what does it mean actually uh, to be free? I think the first thing is to be self-responsible. That is what we need for an economic being, or being coming forward is important, but also for our uh, moral part. Second thing that you asked and you mentioned is what cultural underpinning do we need for a free society? And there are also three things that uh, Hayek has taught us and that has been discussed in all his works. And the first thing, of course, is private property, the protection thereof. Private property is a precondition for a free society. The second thing would be, to my say, uh, saying, the rule of law. And the third is allowing a competitive environment and allowing us to compete among each other as individuals, but also as enterprises. And then thirdly, also as states or nations and even continents economically on that front. So I think there are various layers of uh, freedom and liberty and conservatism that we need to look at. And uh, I'll leave it with that as a starter, and then we can go into the depth of the moral issues. Okay, sounds good. Uh, then as a, um, thank you, thank you very much, Barbara, and we'll, we can go into that uh, more, uh, more deeply later. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Jacob uh, Söderbaum. Uh, who's a, a Swedish um, a publicist. He has, uh, he has uh, written, a, uh, authored a book on conservatism, and he is also the, um, uh, a member of the advisory board of the Roger Scruton 
uh, legacy foundation. So uh, please, uh, Jacob, what's, what's your take on this um, uh, rather general topic, but of course, uh, which cuts to the heart of uh, what brings us together, I think. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I, uh, my take would be, uh, I think, not very far from Barbara's, but uh, with the perspective that there are, as I see it, two major schools on what uh, the philosophy of freedom is, is about. Uh, one being the one from stemming from uh, John Locke and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and the other one stemming from Edmund Burke, uh, with the com how to say compliments by uh, Friedrich Hegel, the German philosopher. Um, where uh, the, the first one is about um, breaking free, uh, is about uh, every individual's right to uh, any kind of uh, thing that he or she wants. Um, and also this means uh, getting rid of borders, getting rid of limitations on, on people, including morality, including religion, including culture. But on the other hand, uh, the Burke, Edmund Burke School uh, on freedom would be rather about preserving those limitations, uh, such as morality, nation states borders, um, certain behaviors, manners uh, that have been inherited. Uh, and while the, if I call it the Lockean School, uh, claims that in the individual is born as a tabula rasa, um, the, the Burkean school would say that you are born into a certain context which, uh, in, in lack of a better word, programs your mind. And uh, when we grow up we learn a certain behavior. And this behavior is about um, not having conflicts between people. Uh, we learn to behave in a civilized manner. Uh, which makes that we, it, it makes it possible for us not to enter into all kinds of conflicts that we would have because we agree on a lot of things and not only the things which the Lockean School says we should only have um, what people agree on in, in contracts entered into by free will, right? But um, the, the Burkean School uh, uh, puts emphasis on that we have a lot of uh, things which we have uh, just by uh, being brought up in a civilized society, we have those, we get those traditions, we, we, we behave in those ways. They are not written contracts, but we know what is right and what is wrong because uh, of, of the context where we grow up in. So the basic uh, difference here is um, that the, the Birkin School would say that uh, we need to preserve civilization in order to have true freedom in a society. But the Lockean uh, and the one of Rousseau says we need to get rid of civilization we, because it puts uh, people in, it makes, uh, in, they, it puts people into slavery all over the world. And then we should go back to, to be free without civilization, the Stone Age uh, civilization, which from a conservative point of view is not a civilization, but uh, the lack of civilization and only people um, and anarchy which means that the strong will rule arbitrarily, um, and that is not uh, freedom at all, from a conservative point of view. That's my take. All right, thank you very much. Uh, putting uh, John Locke uh, versus uh, Burke. Um, uh, interesting, uh, pers personally, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't like to see Rousseau and Locke lumped together, but we, we, can, we can go into and, that. And Hegel on that side uh, as well. Yeah, but but um, of course there's differences as well, and maybe we can go uh, further on that later in the discussion. Uh, the next uh, and the third speaker is uh, Radek Fogiel. He's a Polish uh, member of uh, parliament for the, the Peace Party. He's also the deputy president of the, of the ECR. Uh, so, so very welcome, uh, Radek. Um, you have been also the uh, advisor for quite a long time for um, um, the, the, the chairman of the Peace Party, Mr. Kaczynski. Uh, so, so um, please, what, what is your what is your take um, on on freedom, the philosophical, you know, foundations uh, uh, behind it? Thank you, thank you very much. Answering this very quickly. It's positive. I like freedom. But to elaborate a bit, uh, a bit more, I think um, those, even those very brief uh, comments that we had from uh, Barbara and Jacob showed us, proved that uh, the very concept of freedom is and has been immanently 
uh, part of uh, the whole Western uh, philosophy, the whole history of ideas taken from the point of view of Western civilization is more or less about uh, freedom. Uh, of course, the, we have those uh, disputes, and uh, as, as mentioned uh, by Jacob, we have the concept of freedom from something, from oppression, for, for instance. We have the concept of freedom to something, freedom to do something, and this uh, inevitably uh, has to be connected with, uh, with uh, responsibility, because uh, from our conservative point of view, uh, my freedom ends when yours starts, to quote uh, a classic. But what does it mean uh, for our political family? Because uh, we all we are all aware that when it comes to, let, for example, just the conservative part of the political spectrum, we have uh, fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, neoconservatives, uh, paleo conservatives, liberal conservatives, and I even haven't started with with the liberals uh, on this on this point. So. What do we have in common? And I think freedom, the, the love of freedom, would be one of the most important uh, ideas that brings us all together. Absolutely, yeah. Barbara? Um, can I come in with a quote from by Hayek and then also uh, with two quotes actually, because then we'd, it brings us to what we are right now, where, the situation we are in right now. Uh, one, of course, he says, um, the state in which a human being is not subject to arbitrary coercion by the will of others or another. This is what you actually mentioned. This is in the Constitution of Freedom that Lady Thatcher so um, prominently slammed on the table a uh, couple of years ago. Um, I hope the new government will also use that in, in Great Britain as a precondition. <laughs> and, but and the second quote is, emergencies have always been the pretext on which the safeguards of individual liberty, one could also say freedom, have been eroded. And we have undergone se several emergencies in the past. Um, I mean, at least by, politi by politicians, this was defined as emergencies, whether it was COVID or whether it's now the situation that we see in, in Russia, Ukraine, and uh, the energy problem, et cetera, et cetera. This is always an emergency. Or if we look back a little bit longer in history, uh, the so-called um, financial crash that we have seen in 2008 hitting Europe, which was a sovereign debt crisis, but this has always been an emergency. And there, many of the politicians have left the good ideas of a free uh, society and have, uh, under the disguise of saving society, uh, not saying who is society, but it's actually the taxpayer, um, have left those ideas of a free uh, uh, and prosperous society by uh, imposing laws and regulations on exactly this society that was supposed to be free and with free choice uh, on them. And I think this is the biggest problem. How can we uh, explain to individuals, to citizens, uh, that their freedom is being stolen constantly or is at threat constantly? And I think this is our biggest task. I mean, doing this on a philosophical level and on an academic level is wonderful. And those debates and I think disputes are important. Uh, but the man on the street uh, doesn't care whether it's liberalism, whether it's freedom, whether it's libertarian, or whether it's center, center right, or you know everything that goes into our concept. I think we need to go in depth and and explain to the man on the street what it means if he lo if he cannot pay his um, energy um, fee this year or for his food or whatever. Well, well, going into that, um, let's maybe go, go from to Radek. Uh, if you have to explain to, let's say, ordinary Polish voters, you know, why freedom is important. I mean, what, how would you sort of uh, convince people that sort of once again say, oh, uh, can the government not intervene to do this or that? Or shouldn't we control big companies more or, or you know, all kinds of collectivist uh, uh, talk. I mean, 
as a politician with responsibility, a governing party, like sort of how, how do you address those kind of um, you know, sentiments? Actually, the, the first part of your question is, is pretty easy because uh, there's no, basically no need to explain anyone in Poland uh, how valuable freedom is. We've been, uh, we've lost our freedom a few times in, in history and we treasure it uh, a lot. So this is, this is the easy part. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, politics and especially nowadays politics gives us a lot of challenges also uh, in in terms of uh, of freedom of applying freedom of uh, having to limit some freedoms from uh, from time to time uh, barbara was uh, talking about emergencies uh, we had one additional last year uh, a state of emergency uh, I mean the uh, the attack uh, on Polish uh, as well as Lithuanians and, and other countries' border, uh, perpetrated by uh, by be the Belarusian dictator Lukashenko, and this was also a dispute of different ideas of of freedom because uh, our Polish perspective was uh, every sovereign nation, every uh, nation state, has its right. Uh, is free to defend its borders and uh, should enjoy the freedom of deciding who is uh, entering and who is not. On the other side, we had uh, we had the, the, the leftist movement uh, talking about uh, personal freedoms, talking about <coughs> freedom of movement within <coughs> within the EU, uh, talking about. Uh, being, people being free and the slogan uh, no one can be illegal this was this was a, also a clash of uh, ideas of course as as, um, <coughs> as conservatives as people who treasure national sovereignty the the answer was clear uh, we have to follow what the catholic social uh, uh, teaching uh, calls uh, ordo caritatis. It's your family first, then your broader broader environment, and then if everyone else is safe, you can think about helping the others. But uh, you asked uh, you ask about uh, things that uh, are connected with uh, with the war, for instance, because uh, uh, yeah, there is a great problem when you have to when you're a politician and you have to explain to your voters to your uh, to your uh, countrymen why should they uh, pay three times four times five times more uh, more uh, per for electricity bill or or uh, why the why uh, why gas on gas station is is so uh, so expensive and it's not easy because uh, many people understand the broader perspective that our eastern friends our eastern neighbors have the right to be free from aggression have have the right to be free from uh, being invaded by by a third country and many people in poland understand that but of course when you when you say we should think about the common goal which is to survive this winter so we should think about using a bit less electricity a bit less of heating it's not easy because your natural response to that is you shouldn't be telling me that and I agree. And our philosophy is to not force anyone to do things like that. In Germany, they already—they, I think they've already uh, ha implemented some some bills limiting uh, things like that. We don't want to do in, uh, the same in Poland because we uh, we love freedom, and we also believe that. Polish people have the feeling of responsibility that should be connected to, to freedom, that this can be 
this can be our common goal in this uh, in this uh, case. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rodi. And then maybe going back a bit more to the philosophy, uh, Jacob. Uh, so, so I mean, one of the questions in the in the program is: Are liberalism and conservatism competing, or are there any complementary ideas? Could you maybe give? let's say, one important topic where, in, in your definition of liberalism and conservatism, they are uh, clearly opposed, and maybe another element where you think that's where sort of these philosophies are clearly aligned. Sure, uh, and uh, I already pointed out uh, about uh, the conservatives thinking that preserving civilization uh, is uh, one way to save freedom. While the liberals would would say that, um, in, in in one sense at least, if you're in the the line of Locke and Rousseau, that we should get rid of civilization. However, I want to point point out another thing as well because you also suggested um, this um, classical liberal idea about uh, my freedom ends where your freedom begins, uh, and and the conservative response to that is rather. And then we're talking about freedom with responsibility. My um, freedom ends where my responsibility begins, my obligations towards uh, the better good. Uh, and, and this is an important uh, philosophical uh, distinction um, because it means that there is also a, uh, an ethical sphere which I need to um, um, relate to uh, and not only to uh, the contracts you and I can uh, go into together. And, and one important thing in this uh, is that you can't go into any contracts with anyone if there is no uh, the, the order around it. Uh, we, we know what loyalty means, uh, we, we have language to, to, to write those contracts with, etc. Uh, so that is uh, w w about the, 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 the differences between the conservative and the liberal point I in one sense. And so. What connects them? And, and I think also that you made this point. Um, it's about uh, the Western civilization's heritage of freedom and liberty, which we all, uh, liberals as well as conservatives, are uh, very much for. Uh, and we have different ways uh, to, to pursue this goal, which probably uh, can be used as an advantage. It can also be used as a, um, well, in uh, the war of ideas against each other. Uh, and I think we need both. Uh, and, and one thing is, one of those wars of ideas is on the political level and another is on the academical level. However, uh, what, what we need to um, do together, uh, conservatives with liberals, is um, to see what, uh, to, to find out what, where, where we don't go together uh, and, and have some kind of respect for uh, what is then left uh, is what we should cooperate about. Uh, and, and I would suggest then that there are some ideas by, for example, John Rawls, uh, which is just so absurd. Uh, and uh, that's, that is to point out one uh, thinker. And, and uh, on a principle level, I would say that liberals would need to respect um, that leave culture issues to the conservatives. And then we can also, uh, both conservatives and liberals, would be able to agree on the economical issues. And from a liberal point of view, that is, I think, of the, what is most important in, in the tradition of ideas of liberalism. And I think that conservatives, both liberal conservatives and social conservatives, would agree on this kind of uh, cooperation. All right, and yeah, maybe just for the Americans in the room, that of, of course, when, we're, when we use the term liberalism here, we're, we're talking about Lear real uh, classical liberalism, not about uh, Bernie Sanders kind of style, uh, heart socialism or something. Uh, so anyway, um, Barbara, you want to chip in? Yeah, I want to chip in and I want to take us one step back. Uh, when Professor Legutko in the morning asked, are we more free today than 40 years ago? I think we should look again at what, what happened on the individual level and what has happ happened on the national, supranational level and what, what determines those changes. Looking back in history, and here we are in an in a old Hanseatic city, Tallinn, and we have a lot of 
good examples of where the so-called German uh, notion Stadtluft macht frei, which is city air uh, makes you independent and free, sets you free, um, ha has helped. Um, and we, we should look at the sizes of the institutions. And by institutions, I also mean a nation state or even the EU. And we had always been in Europe, been more successful and more free when those institutions were smaller and flexible and competing among each other or with each other as where the city states or the Hanseatic uh, League with other institutions. And this has uh, shown also both Roman history uh, the, the Roman law and also the old German tribal law. And Hannes Gisverson, who is a specialist on, on these issues, and we had a nice conversation yesterday on that. But both concepts, both laws, have the individual and the freedom in center. And that's something where we should constantly ask, what is the task of the state, namely the institutions? And in order, and this is my argument here, the bigger those institutions are, the less free we as individuals, but also as enterprises are. And that's something, why do we constantly allow, and there is one, one probably divide between libertarians, classical libertarians, and some of the ultra conservatives, not those conservatives here in the room, because some of them want more government, more state intervention, whereas libertarians and, and the conservatives here, I assume, in the room want less of that. And I think this is where we need to act and find solutions. Absolutely. Um, to, to get the uh, government out of the bedroom and out of the boardroom, right, as we say. Uh, so actually, I want to I discuss a um, slightly different uh, side topic, which I think is closely related to the philosophy of freedom, which is the, sort of this phenomenon of wokeism. I'm not sure how, if, I, if it can be described as a coherent philosophy. It, it's sort of a, a mix of, of tribalism with, with a, an extreme obsession for race uh, and um, with stories popping out of, of American universities of, 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 of uh, black students asking for separate spaces for other black students. Um, so, so, I mean, what, what's, what's your take on this? Because many of these people, uh, they, they also consider that they are fighting for freedom. I mean, in, in their definition of it. So maybe, Jacob, you want to you, you wanna comment the whole wokeist development, or I don't know how to describe it. Well, I, I, ha I, I have a certain view, which is the historical perspective of this. And, and in my eyes, this is only the, the latest incarnation of Marxism. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, Marxist institutions uh, in the sense of uh, media and politicians everywhere, academics. Uh, there's an in infrastructure of Marxism which is very old. Uh, and then uh, in 1968, as we know, uh, apart from, uh, I mean, in the Western world, where, where the, the revolutions that weren't as hard as elsewhere, um, it, it was, um, they, were la they were applauding it. Uh, praising it, uh, and, and this is the new thing. Uh, it's probably a few people who, who made up their minds uh, and, and then uh, made a, like, like a business push uh, to certain uh, establishments uh, and saying, we're going to do this, are you with us? Yes, of course, and, and the, then the, there's the applause again because it's the old same shit uh, in, in, a new, uh, in a new way. So. But what, what, so what, how should we deal with this? The problem isn't, it's not the ideas. I, I don't think uh, we should, I really don't think we should care about the ideas we hear because we know them. We can uh, d disguise, they are only disguised. We should go for the infrastructure. Uh, and we should attack the infrastructure and we should uh, try to underpin uh, the arguments uh, from within the infrastructure, not not uh, not to to fight uh, the, the the wars they want to fight. We don't. Sh we shouldn't fight on their arena. We should fight on our arena. We should build our own arenas. We should build our own infrastructures. We're doing that with uh, the help of internet. That's my take. Okay. Uh, Radek, do, do you have any wokers in Poland or? 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, Poland is not uh, free from wokeism or uh, whatever the proper name would uh, would be. Uh, this this is uh, part of the globalism that such uh, such ideas, such um, uh, cultural trends uh, travel very, uh, very, very fast. Uh, luckily. Mm, luckily, Polish Academia isn't that woke yet. Uh, more, or, uh, more or less, uh, people are free to present their their ideas, but um, but the threat is uh, there. Mm, and I completely agree with Jacob uh, saying that this is a, uh, just a different face of uh, of the same classic marxist uh, ideology because what can what can marxism do right now uh, proletariat as uh, was described by by marx and engels is long gone so uh, you have to keep busy you have to find new oppressed and in if if you lack them you have to make other people feel oppressed so you can you can try to speak uh, on their on their behalf that's uh, that's the very idea of this this uh, wokeism finding new oppressed making them making it clear to them that they are oppressed and then become the uh, their uh, their voice and uh, we cannot we cannot uh, uh, we cannot even let ourselves to be held hostage by the language that is used by the by the other side. Uh, the moment we agree for for the language, uh, because I agree how important the infrastructure is, but but even the language, the moment we agree, we are already gone because we are fighting on their on their ground. Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples is the idea of uh, cultural appropriation which uh, has gone so far that uh, there will be there there has been situations when let's say a taco food truck was attacked and and uh, cancelled uh, using the, the the cancel culture idea because the tacos in the US in in those in the in this food truck weren't sold uh, sold by native mexicans but by someone else, uh, a young girl a few years ago was was uh, bashed on social media because she wore a dress to her prom which resembled the traditional Chinese dresses, and she wasn't of Asian descent, so she was accused of, of cultural appropriation. This is a very good idea. How crazy this is! It is Halloween. It's a young girl who wants to look nice during her prom it's it's not a war yeah but yeah. barbara you, you you of course you have uh, lots of uh, experience in in uh, policy uh, policy id campaigns in austria and europe and and um, i mean of course the left strategy uh, conscious or not has been to sort of do the great march through the institutions eh, the universities which you know very well I mean, but also conferences um, that that sort of have have changed in terms in nature in in sort of the kind of ideas they propagate. I mean, in in your view, what is the best strategy for the the freedom movement, the liberty movement to 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 counter this? I mean, is it to say, oh, we boycott universities from now on, or or the opposite, like to 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 go in there and and um, and not build or parallel structures, or, or maybe both. Um. Let me start with a joke. You know why the left has no think tanks? Because they have the universities. So that that's a true. sad that that's a sad truth, and it was only true for Europe until a couple of years ago. And now I think uh, what is going on in the U.S. and in other continents, we can see that they have conquered universities there as well, and uh, talking about woke and wokeism, etc. So the reason is either we come in by the front door, you know. We are those mean libertarians, freedom-loving individuals, conservatives who state the truth and who believe in our values. 
this is, I think, what everybody of us does, one, one methodology. The second is what we also do and need to do. We fight, we fight a guerrilla war, which is coming, back by the, uh, coming in by the back door, which is undermining those institutions and having professors there at the universities, running the free market roadshow at the universities, uh, talking with students, building students' networks, etc. All those things need to be done parallel. And of course, and we can never give up. We have always, we always have to explain the true values of what, a, what it means to be a free and independent society. And, you know, eventually it's, it's tough work. It's like a Sisyphus uh, work, but I think it's definitely worth it because when we lose our freedom, it is too late. Then we have ultimately lost it. So it's a constant battle and constant fight, and there are many different tools of doing it. This was just two tools that we use, but there are many other um, ideas and, and good things that we need to copy-paste. Uh, what was discussed formally at the last panel with the journalists is important that we need to follow those things. What um, politics does by supporting uh, and collaborating with think tanks and what, what New Direction in this case does, bringing in politicians and bringing poli active politicians who believe in our values, who spread the word and uh, work from not only top down as back then Hayek discussed to change in a, a society, but now also bottom up. We have the good, the advantage now to use both top down and bottom up. And I think we need to use each and every tool and collaborate because our enemy is not the person who is probably either a little bit more libertarian than I am or a little bit more conservative than I am. No, the enemy is the other side, is the socialist, is the communist, is those who want to destroy a free society. So I can only say, let's collaborate. Absolutely. And with these wise words, maybe we can uh, we can go to the floor now. So, so um, if there's anybody who wants to make an intervention, ask a question, uh, please put up your hand and uh, also introduce yourself before you ask the question. There's a gentleman in the back. I don't know if there's somebody. Yes, thank you, with a microphone. Thank you. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. Um, David Martin Jones. I. Uh, historian of political thought at the University of Queensland. I'd just like to correct one or two uh, positions here. Firstly, the statement, um, freedom, my freedom ends when yours begins, is completely a misquotation of Karl Popper, who was a negative freedom advocate following Mill. And the line is, my freedom to swing my fist stops at your nose with the understanding that freedom means my freedom to explore myself as a responsible individual, but not to use my freedom to impose something oppressive or violent on another. So I think that's an important point because we can both enjoy freedoms. My freedom is consistent with someone else's freedom if we're in a complementary and competitive society. The second point is to correct the misunderstanding of John Locke. I mean, John Locke was not Rousseauian. He, he was not anti-civilization. He was in favor of limited government. He wrote in the context of absolutism in the Restoration and was deeply involved with the problem of uh, arbitrary uh, absolutist monarchy in which he wrote his two treatises of civil liberty. The whole point of this was to defend not only um, limited constitutional uh, situation, but also property rights. Property rights became central to thinking about liberty from Locke going forward. And Burke, who was a Whig himself, um, had some sympathy for this view, as he shows in his um, work on the um, French Revolution. Sorry, so just to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. M maybe Jacob can can respond. And yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, it's an important discussion also about uh, 
how John Locke should be perceived uh, in this respect. And uh, I, I would say that um, the, I think that the term also in English is uh, natural rights when it comes to John Locke, yeah. Uh, and there is um, one perspective which we, you could put uh, in, in the... Um, uh, one, one perspective is stemming from Aristotle and uh, Aquinas, uh, and that, I would say, is, is about preserving civilization. Then you have a twist which John Locke makes, which turns out that he's against uh, civilization. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, at, anyway, that is my uh, view about it. And, and uh, I think also an important distinction uh, which is in this matter which stems from John Locke is the idea of the tabula rasa uh, that the little baby is born uh, as an unwritten paper um, which means that uh, what um, you, you are an individual you are born good it, it is, is a positive view of humanity and and uh, this is definitely contrary to, to what Edmund Burke says. He has a, a skeptical view of man. You are born uh, incomplete. You can never be a perfect person. Uh, no man is an island, etc. Uh, and and from those two different views, very different views of the human, uh, you have different views on what is a good society, and that is what I'm trying to point out. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a very short uh, response, and then we go to the next question. Yeah, Maybe with the microphone. The idea that Locke was somehow um, outside a Christian position is, is utterly erroneous. I mean, he, was, he, he refers consistently to Hooker, the, the great theorist of the Anglican monarch well the anglican constitution that evolved after 1560 he always refers to hooker as the judicious hooker so his idea of of, of natural law is absorbed into locke's concept of natural right i would argue but, I mean, all right thank you very much let's move on um there's a question here in the front to the gentleman I would actually agree that uh, John Locke belongs to the conservative liberal tradition, especially because uh, his uh, main contribution to the tradition is the defense of property. And uh, if there is anything that characterizes uh, the conservative liberal tradition, it is the belief in, uh, in, in property and in limited government and in free trade. It is true, however, that occasionally he lapsed into something that we could call uh, too much rationalism, for example, in his social contract theory, which is cogently uh, criticized by David Hume. And I would like to point out also that Edmund Burke is really a classical liberal. I mean, he wrote uh, that uh, Adam Smith and David Hume, they more or less uh, agreed with him in, uh, in economics. He was a free trader. Uh, so I believe that uh, Edmund Burke is possibly the first conservative liberal because he uh, turned against the excesses of the French Revolution. The other ones, they, they, they were not confronted by the uh, French Revolution. And uh, the great difference between the two successful revolutions of 1688 and 1789 and the two failed revolutions in 1789 and 1917 is that uh, the, uh, the former ones they were made in order to preserve and extend existing uh, liberties, whereas the other ones were there to reconstruct society. And uh, then I would uh, also object uh, to uh, lumping together Locke and Rousseau. Rousseau was in the second camp. He wanted to reconstruct society. He was against civilization. Uh, he was really <coughs> an absurd personality, where, whereas uh, Locke emphasized liberty under the law. However, I would agree with you actually, uh, Jacob, about one thing. It is that we may be able to enlist Hegel in the conservative liberal course. If you read his Rechtsstaat and uh, his uh, philosophy of history and so on, then you see that uh, Hegel uh, put uh, the, the problem like this, very simply. First, one person was free, the, the tyrant, the dictator. Then some were free, 
the elite, uh, the nobility and so on. And uh, finally, when the Weltgeist has uh, uh, gained uh, consciousness, uh, everybody is free. And that uh, uh, makes us uh, uh, have to so resolve the problem, how are we going, all of us, to live together if all of us are, are free? It's a Hegelian uh, problem, and Michael Oakeshott, he, he uh, presents, uh, for example, a very interesting uh, take on, on Hegelianism, where he uses Hegelian arguments for uh, conservative liberalism. And let me just leave uh, this with one observation, I, uh, a metaphysical Hegelian observation. It is that I believe that uh, conservative liberalism is the self-consciousness of Western civilization. It is Western civilization when it has become conscious of itself and is able to articulate what it means to be a free uh, individual who has uh, gained both the will and the ability to make choices. Thank you. Right. May I add, and how we elevate ourselves, uh, whether it's out of poverty or whatever mismatch we are in. And I think this is the real reason why we should discuss what can help us to elevate and to become freer and to become more prosperous. And there we have to go back to the concept, and thank you for mentioning it again, Hannes, for mentioning the concept of private property. And this is where all those lefties are eroding mm. our values. Absolutely. Uh, we have at least two more interventions because we have to st uh, stop sharp at four. I want to both of them give the chance. So maybe first Matt and then gentleman over there. Um, in the in the back. Uh. Thanks, uh, Peter, and thanks to the panelists. It's been a really interesting conversation. I'm Matthew Robinson, the chairman of the Northern Ireland Conservative Party and director of the Eurogulf Information Centre in Rome. Uh, I think Barbara mentioned uh, trying to the idea of trying to square some big government conservatism with the concept of freedom. And I wonder, how do we square from a practical policy standpoint certain social issues, whether it be same-sex marriage, reproductive health rights for women, drug policy, with the concept of freedom? Because naturally, there are differences of opinions probably in this room on, 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 on those issues. But to some people, those are fundamental issues of, of freedom. And, uh, to look to our, some of our colleagues in the US and the, the Republicans, you're seeing on a state-by-state -state level, some Republicans starting to buy into more socially liberal ideas through ballot initiatives on drug policy, buying into the concept of what for the former US Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brandeis uh, uh, framed as sort of, uh, using states as laboratories of democracy. I wonder, have we got a little lazy in Europe to push the boat out a bit on some of these social issues to try and champion a cause for, for freedom. Sure, Barbara, if you want. Uh, quick answer. There is a picture of uh, Reagan out there on the New Direction banner, and there is one famous quote, starve the beast. In other words, you know, not allow government to become big, 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 and tax us in any way, and allow by having all this money and place to intervene in each and every little thing that involves a citizen. And you mentioned one thing, leave government out of the boardroom and the bedroom, and it's none of their business. Jacob? Yes, and my answer would be that we need Friedrich Hegel uh, to define what are really natural rights, and not only uh, as ideas or uh, contracts we agree upon, that th this is rights we the majority wants. There are natural rights which are there just for the sake of creating this freedom, liberty in our societies which evolve through civilization. If we don't believe in natural rights or think that natural rights are something we agree upon, such as human rights, uh, we're on the wrong track, basically. And just to add uh, on top of that very shortly, I could say that while we discuss uh, a government uh, limited uh, or not, and we are of course in favor of, of the, the, the latter, the role of government, the, the, I, one of the ideas of, the, of this social contract um, that, that created the modern state was to 
preserve the state and the and the nation. So this again we go back to the idea of responsibility uh, because uh, implementing freedom understand in a way that could enable the very nation or, or the, 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 the very state to disappear within two or three generations wouldn't be responsible. Okay. There's uh, one more question over there. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for this fascinating discussion. Um, um, I was I was thinking while you were talking, like the ideology, the woke ideology. You were saying it's it's hard to define actually because no one calls himself woke, you know. So it's a category we have created to define a group that it's hard to define. The same way sometimes people call conservative, like neoconservative, to criticize some features that we don't identify as such. Uh, on this regard, I think like one thing that it's 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 more complicated than the way it appeared in the discussion is that works are just reform um, former socialists. And I work, sorry, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Ignacy Grau, and I work in in the field of educational policies. But in my field, for instance, I see a lot of people advocating for the smaller state, but um, in the in the field of economy. But then when they talk about education. Um, they say like parents shouldn't have the right to choose the education they want for their children, or even they they want um, certain contents out removed from education, or they want to impose certain contents on behalf of freedom. And I think here there is an important feature that has been mentioned um, in the work ideology, which is the, the issue of dependency. Like human beings, I think we are called for freedom, but also we are dependent human beings and we are dependent on biology and we are dependent on history and we are dependent on our cultural circumstances. My question somehow is like, don't you think that more, that the danger more within the woke moment, one of the problems is that they are taking freedom without considering the wake of circumstances because these people are calling freedom to overcome the dependency, which is a natural feature of the human being. Thank you. Who wants to uh, comment on this? Well, this is a good uh, this is a good point. I, I guess this uh, is a in some in some way uh, in some sort this is a way of rebelling against uh, against the very loss of of uh, universe in this in this game is the loss of. Uh, uh, biology. Mm, I think it's uh, it's a topic for a whole new discussion. Uh, what is the reason of that? Uh, why are some people inclined to uh, to to do this? But uh, I would say that uh, that the. Uh, Woke ideology, as we <laughs> may may uh, try to call it, when 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 there isn't a better word, is exploiting uh, some people's weaknesses in order to uh, to make them more uh, even more dependent on uh, on their leaders. Okay, maybe before we, we close off, um, I would like to invite you uh, to, to end with a, a positive, optimistic note. So each of you, if you could say in one sentence, um, what has, according to you, been a positive development for, for freedom in the, in the last few years? And if there is no positive development, of course, you can also say so. Barbara? An event like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Jacob? So in the last few years, um, uh, well, <laughs> it's hard, but I would say that, um, I, I would put it like this, uh, from where I stand as a conservative, uh, I see that there is a new, which I think very fruitful intellectual debate in Sweden and in Norway and in several other countries in both Western and Eastern Europe. I'm not quite sure about the United States, but it, it's a new, uh, I think, very fruitful discussion. And it, it, at the core of, of this discussion is uh, Western values of which uh, the freedom that we have uh, is uh, probably one of the most, very most important values. Uh, there is a new debate about this. Okay. And I will, uh, adding to that, I would say, even though there are a lot of socialists, particularly, and, and some liberals who don't 
believe in the Visegrad countries. I would say that they are adding to this debate. Uh, take the debate. Okay. Thank you. Radek? I'll try to, to, to be positive here. Uh, Barbara mentioned before that uh, we like our institutions small and uh, flexible, and uh, the European Union is definitely none of them. Uh, and this, this Leviathan is, is still growing, but on the optimistic note, I would say that there is at least recently uh, a debate that it should change, a debate which is, from my political view, even more importantly followed by, uh, by decent election results. We've got Sweden, we've got um, Italian elections coming in, Two days, and if we can make this change as, as uh, liberals, as conservatives, then we're on a good track. Okay, wonderful. So, thank you very much.